Draft Mechanic is a proud member of Punchboard Media. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Draft Mechanic, episode 123. On this episode of Draft Mechanic, we discuss recent plays of Control, Flash 8, Mega City Oceania, and Bargain Quest with the Black Market expansion, which we're putting on tap. And we've got a hop primer for the divisive Sriracha Ace hops. <laughs> so sit back, relax, grab a pint, and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Draft Mechanic. I'm Jake. And I'm Danielle. And Draft Mechanic is the podcast about board games and craft beer and anything we can do to tie the two together. Here at Draft Mechanic, we like our beer like we like our board games. With an eye for value. Yeah, I mean, I do love an eye for value on my beer and board games and some weird intonation on our intro as Look, well. It's been 123 episodes. I'm trying to change it up just like slightly. So it's a little more interesting coming into that one, I guess. I, I don't want to I don't want to get stuck in a routine where we just say exactly the same thing every episode for the first 65 seconds. But anyway, if you're looking for more information on Draft Mechanic, you can always hit us up on the internet, draftmechanic.net, or at Draft Mechanic on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the regular places, so on and so forth. Those are the things. We've got a Board Game Geek Guild. That is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up there for this episode, as there is for every episode. So Mm -hmm. if we're talking and you have an opinion on what we're talking about, or you just want to tell us that we're wrong, that is the place to do it. It's not the same every episode, though, because this used to be the time when I would say, if you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, we have meetups here and then, but we don't have those anymore. So uh, if you're listening to this in the future and things have somehow gotten better (laughs) and meetups are a thing again, yay. Good. Good. But they aren't right now. Yes. If you're playing a game at home, however, and you want to pretend that you're doing a draft mechanic virtual meetup, that's not a thing we've invented yet. So I don't know. I I I think you just like drink a beer or a yeah. cider if you're having a beer with your games tweet at us maybe at turn your lights down a little there bit lower go. than you'd like them to be yeah true we <laughs> got to get better lighting next time we do those anyway uh we also have a board game geek micro badge if you would like to get that micro badge you can go into our guild again that is 2470 is the guild i will give you geek gold if you want it look for the thread that is pinned up at the top daniel i don't really have any news this particular episode i hope that's okay like most news is just like there's a bunch of new games coming out that's cool well yeah but- because online conventions happened and people announced stuff yeah but i don't want to just like sit here and be like this game is coming and this game is coming so i'd rather just like deal with those things organically as they come up over the next few years as those games come out we'll talk about those games so maybe we talk about games that are coming in the near future in a weird transition danielle perhaps a kickstarter update okay we talked about lunar base last episode from ole busboard jensen and that is funding at forty thousand dollars of its sixteen hundred dollar goal with eleven hundred and thirty five backers it has 10 days to go as of the time of recording Mm -hmm. so if you're still interested in that you can go to kickstarter and check it out Uh, That's actually not super helpful the way that's written. It is through (laughs) September 3rd is when the campaign ends for Lunar Base. September 3rd, 2020. To be even more useful in an unuseful way. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Moving right along in new projects. I have one for you that is an expansion to a game that was released this year. It is coming from Grand Gamers Guild. It is called New Species, the expansion for Endangered. This one is currently funding at 94000 of its $15,000 goal with over 1,300 backers. Ends on Friday, August 28th with an estimated delivery of September 2021. That is a year from next month. Uh, you can get the expansion for 45 bucks, or you can pledge $99 to get the expansion and the base game with all of its Kickstarter stretch goals, which is nice because Grand Gamers Guild does do some cool Kickstarter stretch goal, high quality components, and some extra content. Do you get a real tie? You do not get a real tiger, thankfully. Yeah, I wouldn't want one, but that would be impressive. But I wouldn't want one. Two things there. That would be a very low-cost tiger, and I don't want a low-cost tiger. I also don't want a tiger. And I also don't want a tiger. There are no tigers that I want. But the ones that I want even less are the ones that have been eerily discounted. That is not a good eye for value. Tying it all into Bargain Quest, I guess. All right, so anyway... Uh, The new species expansion for Endangered, it adds a whole ton of content to Endangered, which is a dice-based cooperative game where you work as conservationists to save endangered species. Basically, everybody has a different role of a specific type of, you know, 
influencer, I guess, in a way. There's people that are lobbyists. There's people that are like nature TV show hosts and stuff like that. Um, And you are all working together as conservationists to save a particular species in each scenario of the game. The base game comes with, I believe, three scenarios of different uh, endangered species. And you're working together to kind of take actions to save the species and relocate uh, animals and, you know, do mating things with... Not with those animals, between those animals. Sorry. Um, And also, at the same time, you are working to lobby um, ambassadors from the UN to institute policies that will allow you to procure, or not procure, to secure a better future for these endangered species. It's a really cool concept and a cool idea. Um, We haven't had a chance to play this one yet, but I am kind of interested to get at it at some point, because it is a unique theme, and it does have dice rolling cooperative gameplay, which are things I generally like. Um, thing that's cool about this new expansion is that the base expansion adds four new scenarios. So you have elephant, sea turtle, the jaguar, and tapir, and the polar the bear. Taper, taper. There you go. I love the taper. Yeah, the jack. I'll go, come back to the one in a second. And stretch goals so far have added two more: California condors and the devil's hole pupfish, which is the most endangered fish in the entire world and only exists in one particular sea shelf near Death Valley. Yeah, it's, it's got a hell of a name. Devil's Hole Pupfish. Uh, the expansion also it contains a new role type, which is the celebrity. Um, so you can you know use that. And there's also some new ambassadors add out on new victory conditions. So it's a lot of new content. Uh, it's a really significant expansion with, you know, I guess if you back the Kickstarter here, you're getting six new scenarios that you can play. And they're obviously going to be, you know, different depending on the ambassadors you get in there that all have different uh, requirements for what you need to satisfy them to get them to put policies in place. So a lot of good content there. And if you are looking for a new cooperative dice game maybe this is one you want to take a look at and also a lot more of it sorry i'm just googling tapers on my phone oh right uh that was the interesting thing about the jaguar and taper one is that it's an interesting um predator prey dynamic that you're working with in that particular one um so as opposed to other ones where you're just trying to like oh we got to save all these elephants you have to save the jaguar and the tap here Taper? Taper. Taper. Uh, taper. You have to say, save the jaguar and the taper while preserving kind of a relationship there, which is an interesting way of well, looking at this. the jaguars are going to eat all the tapers. Not all, because then you will lose, probably. Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah. For uh, the record, tapers <laughs> are like pigs with trunks. It's Aww. adorable. That does sound really cute. We'll look up some pictures maybe during the break after we uh, end this segment. But if you are interested, Endangered New Species Expansion is on Kickstarter right now for a few more days. End of this week, if you're listening to this week of release. So go check it out. Go so, check it out. Yeah, through August 28th, 2020. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. We are going to take a break, look at pictures of tapers, and you can listen to some words about t-shirts. Nice. Have you been wearing the same five t-shirts over and over again for the last several months to the point where they would not be work appropriate for an impromptu Zoom meeting? Why not head over to redbubble.com slash people slash draft mechanic and pick up a new draft mechanic t-shirt to throw into the rotation. That way you don't have to explain to your coworkers about that weird sternum tattoo of a dice tower you got at Gen Con a few years back. Uh, back at it in the recent plays section. Here we are once again talking about games we've recently played. What a great heading to a section. I've done a great job with that. This is why you usually get the first game. (laughs) Anyway, we are talking about Control. It is a 2020 release from Pandasaurus Games. It plays two to four players in about 20 minutes. It is designed by Julio Nazario with art by Stevo Torres. This is a three-dimensional abstract game of cubes, cubes, and popping off cubes. And flags, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there are flags and cubes. Flags and cubes. Uh, By the way, uh, Control is... C T R L. If you're looking that up, it is not the full word control, mm-hmm. like the uh, like the key on your keyboard. Yeah. So to play control, you start with a three dimensional cube, which you're going to set on the table in front of you. And each side of the cube, other than the bottom, because like I said, you set it on the table in front of you, so the bottom doesn't matter. The other five sides each have three by three sets of, of holes. So you know, three rows of three holes, sort of like a Rubik's cube. And each player is going to get these three-dimensional plastic cube pieces of their color. I think blue, green, pink, and yellow are the the four Mm -hmm. colors. And they're going to get a flag of their color. Everybody is going to start on a different side of the cube. And on their turn, they're going to take three of their little cube pieces. And they're going to place them starting from a space adjacent to one of their existing cubes and moving in a straight line. They're, again, like I said, placing three pieces a turn, so you're very likely going to reach the edge of the cube. If that happens, 
instead of just continuing to build out into the ether, your pieces will <laughs> roll over onto the nearest flat side. So you'll build sort of around the cube, even though it is not sphere shaped, you are making sort of a spherical motion around it. Mm -hmm. Then at the end of your turn, you will take your flag and stick it out of one of the holes on the side of one of the cube pieces that is your color. They have uh, indentations for the flag on all the sides. So as long as it's not facing the cube or down towards the table, you can put the flag there. This flag is going to block other people from placing cubes on the spaces that it occupies on their turn because everybody is just going to keep placing sets of three cubes on their turn covering up other cubes that have been placed and moving around this sphere cube, cube. thing. Cube, cube Cuboid. The object is to have the most, or not the most, but to have a lot of your cubes showing from multiple different perspectives. Because at the end of the game, once everybody has placed all of their cubes onto this structure, you're going to check from each of the five sides, again, not the bottom, of the cube structure originally and count how many faces are unobscured of each player's color. You're going to add up all the five totals and whoever has the highest total in general of all five sides is going to be the winner of control. I have been looking forward to playing some of Julio Nazario's games for a while. We keep running into him at Unpub events, and he's relatively local to us. He's up in Asheville. Um, Seconds away. Yeah, which I guess is not like terribly local. We've never actually run into him in Asheville, but at you know co conventions and stuff around the area. For the amount of times you're in Asheville, it might as well be local. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but I've been really looking forward to playing some of his designs once they get published because he's got a really interesting way with three-dimensional spaces. You know, a lot of his stuff is very three-dimensional, multiple tiers of boards or interesting component setups like this and control is definitely one of those it's a eye-catching look of just this cube of cubes that keeps growing and growing and growing and i'm a little frustrated as well that the components aren't as good quality as i would have hoped for a game that is so tactile okay yeah there's there's very little way to talk about this game without talking about the main component yeah situation that we ran into mm-hmm which is, quite frankly, that more than half of our games, just the cubes exploded off the little base Yeah, structure. like you're, you're going to press cubes into one side and, you know, you're kind of bracing yourself against the other side of the cube and like a chunk of six pieces falls off and you've got to figure out, oh, where did these come from? We got to put them back in. And it's really frustrating because we actually had to play this game a bunch more times to get scores that we didn't put an asterisk on. Mm-hmm. On the plus side, I enjoy the gameplay a lot. I think it's fun to play, and it's a fun puzzle for me specifically. I like abstracts, and I like interesting three-dimensional thinking like that. Yeah, I mean, the game itself is interesting. I'm not as crazy about the style of game as you are. Mm -hmm. it's, this is not exactly in my wheelhouse, but I had fun playing it. Like, it's short enough that it doesn't feel like you're spending the entire game getting pummeled if you're not doing well, yep. and it's... It's a fairly, I mean, it's a very simple mechanic. It's find your cube, move in a straight line, try to make these the most visible in all the directions. It's very simple and it's fun. And the use of the flag, while I never really felt like it was absolutely winning me the game, yeah. especially at the very end, using that flag, what it does is it blocks other players' faces, even though it doesn't completely cover them. It's just a flag. But at the end scoring, if your flagpole is in front of a bunch of other the other players' cubes, yeah, it blocks them. That so is that was rough. fun. But the fact that literally more than half the games we played were unscorable without, without an asterisk. An asterisk. Yeah. And I mean, one of them was just unscorable. We lost <laughs> more than half the cube. Yeah. And it was it's just frustrating. But I also see it as the thing that would have made it better is if the pieces snap together harder right yeah if there had been a better click or something yeah like if they, but that would mean that if you went to adjust your placement like you decided you were either either placing them wrong which is something that you would need to adjust by the rules of the mm -hmm. game which is something that happened at least to me and i think tamara had done this as well in the in the yeah, getting a feel for the way stuff rolls over or something like yeah, that. Yeah, because you don't need to build up to build over. It automatically will roll over, which wasn't intuitive to me at first. Mm -hmm. So you would need to remove those pieces. But if you made them snap together harder, when you went to remove them, you might break the cube apart. Yeah. And it's like, it's such a bummer that this is one of the biggest things we have to say about this game. But it really is kind of frustrating to not 
have that kind of uh, component quality that we really wanted. Because frankly, when I got this and I opened it up and I started looking at it, I'm like, oh, this is a perfect take it to the brewery or to the bar or something like that game. Mm. Because I thought it's a bunch of plastic pieces. Um, you don't have to have a bunch, you know, there's no cards. It's yeah. the kind of thing that you can put it down. It's 100% it water player. resistant, yeah, except and, for the little flags on the flag poles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we were playing this actually the very first time we played it. We were up at Burial in Asheville, uh, just coincidentally, uh, for a game trade that we'll actually talk about later interesting um but we're sitting there we're playing it and i'm like oh this is perfect this is the exact moment that i want to have this particular game and then we had the first pop and we're just like well oh crap <laughs> that's annoying well yeah and we were sitting on the roof to get more space and i was worried we were going to lose <laughs> some of them off the side of the building yes thankfully no cubes were lost in the playing of this game but one thing you mentioned that immediately like jumped to mind the other component issue was this would be a great game to bring to the bar or the brewery. Yeah. Except for one thing. Hmm. Oh. Remember I said that the colors were blue, green, pink, and yellow. Yes. Pink and yellow. No problem. Mm-hmm. Blue and green, incredibly similar in anything except excellent lighting. Yeah. It's the kind of thing that sitting up on the roof uh, atop burial... It was perfectly clear and we didn't have any issue. And honestly, I think we didn't have one of those colors in because we were playing three players. But playing in our dining room or something where we don't have the greatest lighting all the time unless we, you know, turn the thing all the way up. Well, even if you do, you score this thing sitting on the table because Mm -hmm. you need to be able to, A, make it not explode. So it needs to be like sitting there. Mm. And B, there you just like it's easier to get perspective if you put it flat on a table but that means some things are shadowed and the blue and the green, because these are pastel colors, look incredibly similar. What color would you have changed? I Either the blue or well, like, the green. To what? I mean, like maybe a purple or something? Maybe like, purple like instead of blue. I that think, would be different. Enough. I think the answer to me is to saturate the colors a little bit more yeah. to make them less pastel. But I mean, even a black or a white, which was what was suggested when we were talking about this with our with our, yeah. our game group. White would be good because you have the base color of the cube, which is black. Well, yeah, but yeah. you don't see any of that by the end of the game. But <laughs> white would have been fine. It would have been far enough away from yellow, I think. Yeah. I say that, but I don't know. Mm. But like even just putting more color into the color would have made it easier to score. Yeah. Whereas the blue and the green, the way they are, you need to be very careful when you're counting. Yeah. So, like, again, I hate that we are spending so much time talking about the actual components of this game, but it is the real question and the thing that you need to know if you're looking to play this game. Um, Be aware you need to have, I guess, calm hands or something and be really aware of your forces when you are playing it. And I say that because rather than I say that rather than saying don't play this because I think you should play this game. I think if you like abstract games, it does it in a new I hate to say this, dimension, adding in that third dimension into an abstract game is fantastic. And I'm like, I'm so excited to see more of Julio's designs as time goes on. And we get, you know, different stuff like Holy that's coming out from Floodgate Games has that three tier board about fireworks displays. I'm so freaking excited to see that. And I just think he's got a really great design mind of thinking in new dimensions and spaces. And I want to ho- I'm really hopeful that component quality matches that in the future. Yeah, I think the reason that we're so quick to jump on the component issues is that the game itself is incredibly simple. Yeah. Like, you can teach this game to anyone. I, I feel confident that we could take this game to my parents, which is sort of my my baseline for could we teach this to literally anyone. Yeah. My dad plays games a decent bit. My mom plays Yahtzee, and she will live and die by Yahtzee. Mm-hmm. But beyond, like, Yahtzee and cards, if there's much more rules than that, she's not in. She doesn't want to learn these games. I feel like we could take this to my parents and they'd have fun with them. Yeah. That being said, when the rules are that simple, it leaves a lot of room for you to notice the things that are a problem because it's not the rules getting in your way and it's not the rule book being bad because there's like a rule pamphlet. Yeah. It's very, you know, straightforward. But when you can't score the games because they've either fallen apart or you can't see the colors, that's a problem. Yeah. So hopefully... Um, If there is a second printing of this, they fix some of those issues. And if not, I highly encourage you to at least get a a few plays of this in because it is fun. It is interesting and looks at um, abstract games from a different perspective. Nerd. I'm going to continue putting that joke in there. But anyway, that is Control CTRL from Pandasaurus Games designed by Julio Nazario. One to watch in the future. And now, I guess, because this is his first published design. Okay. 
Now let's talk about Mega City Oceania, which is a 2019 release from Hub Games. It plays two to four players in 45 to 60 minutes. The designers are Jordan Draper and Michael Fox. The artist is Winnie Sheck. This is a dexterity building game with Euro game point collecting on high yet calm seas. Yes. Mega City Oceana is a game that I have talked about uh, a little bit over the years, or year, I guess. This was actually something that placed high on my top 10 of 2019, and we've had a chance to play it some more, and I feel like we need to get this game its fair due and we start talking about it on the show more, because I like cool dexterity games, and this one is a cool dexterity game, in my opinion. Is this really a dexterity game? Well, yes. So, Mega City Oceania is a re-implementation of Tokyo Jukatu, which is one of Jordan Draper's Tokyo series games. Uh, in Tokyo Jukatu, basically you have a bunch of oddly shaped pieces, and you are using them to build blueprints of stacks of those pieces that kind of look like buildings in one way or another. Michael Fox started working with Jordan Draper on creating a new game based on those pieces, which became Mega City Oceania. So in Mega City Oceania, you and all of the other players are contractors, which are building buildings to float out onto the Mega City that you are building on the Oceania. Yeah. yeah, the ocean. Yeah. Basically, it is you building buildings with these pieces on to these little hexagon platform tiles and then sliding that piece out into the center of the table in front of you, which is the mega city itself. Um, it starts off as just a central park tile, which is just, you know, one empty space. And by the end of the game, you've built up this city with all these interesting shapes and spires and different color tiles and stuff like that to make a really interesting and exciting visual appearance on the table. On your turn, you're going to take two actions out of a big pool of actions. You can draw pieces out of the bag, and these are those oddly shaped pieces. They come in glass, concrete, and metal. Basically, you know, three different colors. There's clear, light gray, dark gray. Yeah, they're all plastic, to be clear. Oh, yes, true. They are all <laughs> plastic pieces. Or maybe you're going to take one of the platform tiles, which come in four colors, or maybe you're going to take one of the contract cards, which come in four matching colors there, that dictate what kinds of buildings you want to build. And that's where the main focus of the game is. You get these contract cards that tell you you need to have a 45 meter tall building with six pieces and it can't use any glass. Or maybe it has to have an archway in a specific way. The building actually takes place between your turns, which is interesting because it eliminates that downtime in a way. On that downtime between your turns, that's when you are free to use your pieces to physically assemble a building that meets the requirements of the contract card you're working on. It has to be on a platform of that particular color and follow whatever guidelines there are there. And then additionally, each of those tiles has a few different things you have to cover up. There are three utility ports, which are small circles that you must have covered or touched by building pieces. And then there is a vent piece, which must be uncovered, not piece. There's a vent um, symbol on the, the tile that must be uncovered. So once you have assembled this building in front of you that meets all the requirements, when it gets back around to your turn, you say, I'm going to deliver, and that's going to take both of your actions for the turn. Everybody waits with bated breath and stares at you as you push this cardboard hexagon into the middle of the board and hope for a lot that you built a stable enough building that it will not fall over. If you get there, Great, good job. You've built a building. You can put one of your player tokens on it saying, I built this building. If it's the tallest building, you get to put the tallest building marker on it. It gets you additional points. And if you're next to a park, either the central park that we start out around, or if you play your own park tile, which is another tile that you start the game with, you add monuments to those pieces that get you additional points. Um, I'll leave all the kind of nitty gritty of that to you when you go to play this game. You, the listener, not you, Danielle, because you've already done this. I have. Yes. Um, and then... If it does fall down on that delivery, you feel very sad, but you take all your pieces back and your turn is over. And you must wait until it is your turn again to build another piece tower. Yeah, you, you continue trying to build with them. Yeah, oh yeah. You don't lose them or anything. That's good. I'm really glad you don't lose those pieces. So once um, all of the contract cards that were dis uh, dealt out at the beginning of the game have been chosen by players we're going to put in four kind of end game contracts that are really big ones they want you to have you know nine plus pieces and have to be 75 or 80 meters tall and have interesting 
two requirements. And then pretty much once those um, are getting claimed by people and all of the standard ones are complete, the game will end. And you'll count up all the points from your contract cards, from any tallest building awards you've had, or for any you know park monuments. Uh, because if you have buildings around a park that has a monument on it, that building gets another point. And then you total up your points and you admire the big city you've made. Whether or not you've won, you've contributed to the big mega city. Danielle, that is the end of that thing that I've said. Yeah, it is. Sure so is. You met, you said earlier you don't know if this qualifies as a dexterity game. And I'm kind of in the same place because it is a game with dexterity components, but it doesn't feel in, like it doesn't feel like what you would usually call a dexterity game. Like it feels like it has a dexterity requirement, but I wouldn't call it a dexterity game because mm-hmm. it's a puzzle game. Yeah. The object of the game is to take the junk that you pulled out of the bag and make it into the thing that you want it to be in a way that you are fairly sure is sturdy enough that you can push it across whatever table you have properly or improperly chosen to play (laughs) this game on and get to the center. Yes. The the puzzle is the the thing that makes you feel like you've done this game correctly. Yeah. But there is a dexterity requirement that feels more to me like just sort of a necessity and okay. perhaps an exclusionary one at that. Yeah, no, I mean, there's no way around it. If you are um, not able to handle very fine dexterity, this game is not playable. Yeah. Just straight up, because you are balancing awkward, tiny pieces in in awkward ways. Mm-hmm. And for me, somebody who likes to do those kind of things, this is a game that's fantastic for me. But I think that this is definitely a game that people are going to be like, I can't even play this i don't you know my hands aren't steady enough to do this or i can't really understand the you know the balance that we need to to build a game like this yeah also don't play this game with small children who hit the table Mm -hmm. and i think that that is another thing that is worth bringing up right in the beginning i have never been happier to have just random play mats sitting around uh, because when we play this at house, at house, at when house. We, we play, look, house is everything in the world these days. So it's it's house. Um, but when we played this at home on the dining table, we were like, oh, do we take the tablecloth off to play on the hardwood table? I'm like, actually, I'm just going to go get a play mat. And I think, honestly, that made it really, really smooth comparatively. Yeah. If we had removed the tablecloth, that also would have worked because it is a mm-hmm. flat table that doesn't have any leaves in it at the moment, I b- believe. But, like, if we had played this on the tables at our meetups, Mm -hmm. those have big hunking gaps between the pieces of wood. They're made out of two by fours. So between them, I can see this being incredibly frustrating while you're trying to slide your little piece Mm -hmm. and there is a, you know, a quarter inch little gap or or difference between the height of the board. So you need to have a nice flat. Mm -hmm non-gapped table to play this on now i know i have played this at good road and i don't remember how that worked maybe i just got really lucky and we had a really flat table that time but it is the kind of thing you've got to be aware of you've got to have the right surface to play this game on mm-hmm. um i guess the question that i have for you is now that you have played this game on the correct surface a few times how do you feel about it was this fun to play for 45 minutes <sighs> i'm very torn because The part where you're building the little structure is, like, doing the actual puzzle of it is fun Mm -hmm. to me. However, there were definitely some things in this game that I found the opposite of fun. Okay. For one, like, I absolutely hate to make people wait for me on my turn. Yes. I don't love doing it for other people, but I can manage that. Like, everybody can play the game however they'd like. But if, if it's my turn and I'm trying to maybe finish this building so I can deliver it. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to make you wait. Not even like while I place one last piece. I'm going to either take some more pieces or I'm going to slide this thing in and it's going to fall apart. Yeah. And at that point, if you know it's going to fall apart and you deliver it anyway because you just don't want to make people wait, you've wasted your turn. Yeah. Um, now, if you are willing to make people wait for you, that's not a problem. Mm. For me, it makes me very uncomfortable. So that was very frustrating to me. And I know one of the other players that we were playing with a couple of times tried to deliver a building that he thought was good, and it, for some reason or another, fell apart. It Mm -hmm. didn't have the right balance or whatever. And he lost his turn like three turns in a row. Yes. And it was really frustrating. So I appreciate the puzzle of the stacking, but more often than not, I felt 
sort of uncomfortable during the play of the game. Yeah, and this is something that I had noticed in a few games that I had played, but when we played most recently earlier this week, I didn't mention those concerns to the other two players who were new to the game, and I wanted to see how they reacted to it. Uh, So I was, on my turns, trying to go a little slower, but I wanted to see if on their turns they were trying to take those actions quicker and pass the bag quicker. And the game kind of weirdly forces this turn rush where it's my turn. Oh, I'm going to take three pieces out of the bag. And oh, geez, I guess I'm just going to take three pieces out of the bag, pass it to the next person. And the next person is like, oh, crap, I wasn't expecting to get the bag so soon. But now I've got to make decisions. And it's weird for this game that has no real time component and just encourages you to build on your off turns that it kind of forces itself into a quick, quote unquote, real time game in a way that I wouldn't have expected. And again, maybe that's the kind of thing that if you are able to set the ground rules with your game group beforehand, hey, please take your time so we can all have time to build our buildings effectively. Um, That might be the kind of thing that you can say in advance and kind of save yourself that hassle. But it is just a weird side effect of this game that I didn't see coming. Yeah, and it's not... It's not a complex thinky game enough that you can sort of justify to yourself. Like if I'm playing Vinos, Mm -hmm. I will sit there and take a few extra seconds to make sure the thing I'm going to do is the thing that I want to do. Yeah. Because it's going to absolutely destroy my next three hours if it's not. (laughs) Or if we're playing Agra or something like that. But this is not that long a game and it's not that complex a game so i think the idea of making people wait for me actually becomes worse in a in a lighter game like that it's it's a fun game it's fun to build the little structures that's Mm -hmm. the fun part of this game for me um i don't know if we said it but meters in this game are just millimeters and it comes with a little tower ruler yeah two little rulers which is awesome you can use to stand up next to your building to make sure you meet the height requirements on your cards the building part is super fun Mm -hmm. i like them i like that there are different requirements there are those archways that you need to build in which means you need to have pieces that are stable enough that you can build an archway yeah there are ones that only require or that can only use two of the three colors so you have to make sure that you've pulled enough pieces that you have the number of pieces that you need to build your building Mm -hmm. and that's fun i like that part of it but for some reason the framework becomes very stressful yeah it's it's strange because it's not pushed anywhere in the rule book and it seems like at face value everything is going to be a very you know not relaxed but focused and kind of calm slow paced building process and then you just find yourself in this space where you're like oh, we're gonna run out of ocean we're maybe, not maybe not actual ocean but yeah if you like dexterity ish things but you want something more deep than just throwing stuff into piles which is not a good explanation of dexterity games. Um, I would encourage you to at least give it a go if you have that kind of manual dexterity that you can build things and you like to stack things in a fun way. If you're always fumbling around with your meeples uh, during somebody else's turn on Carcassonne, perhaps this game is for you. I guess. Yeah. Like, okay. I do that all the time. But <laughs> yeah, I'll- I think it, it very much has to do with your temperament, whether or not this game is going to be fun for you. Mm-hmm. If, if you are willing to let it go that okay it's my turn and i was supposed to build this on my off turn but i can get it done and i can get those points and do that now then this game is good that that this is fun there will not be a stress component for you Mm -hmm. if the idea of that makes you itchy then this may not be the game for you yeah so those are the caveats and the benefits and if you are interested mega city oceania is available in the world and you can play it with your hands yeah that's, the, that's really the only thing that has enough dexterity. The pieces only move when you move. All right. Moving right along. This is a game where the pieces definitely need to move uh, a lot. It is called Flash 8. It is a 2019 release from Les Scorpion Masqué. Plays one to four players in 10 to 15 minutes. Designed by Joan Dufour with art by Sabrina Miramon. This is a pattern matching speed game that will save every one of us. Flash. <laughs> Yeah. Now, you said this is a 2019 release, but it did just come out in the U.S. this year. Very true. Very true. 
if you speak French and buy from French stores, you got it last year. Mm-hmm. And I'm jealous of you because this game is so much fun. Yeah. And uh, we actually talked about this one at our PAX Unplugged recap because we had a chance to sit down and play this and stay cool that we talked about in the last episode. We did. Yay. So in Flash 8, everybody is going to start with a board. And into the board, you set eight little discs. The discs have different colored characters on them. You have several blue pieces. I think you have three blue, maybe two yellow, a green, a purple, and a red. That mm-hmm. sounds right. That sounds right, yeah. And you maybe a four blue, I guess. You have eight pieces, and you're going to put them into this board that it has space for three by three pieces. So you will have one empty space. And if you've ever played one of those slide puzzles you had when you were a kid where you're trying to get the numbers in order and they start all out of order, you understand how to play Flash 8 already. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of the game, everybody's going to get their grit, their board, and their pieces. You are going to shuffle the cards and set them out into three piles with ten cards each. And the cards each have a pattern on them. It may be, you know, the top corner, top left corner is a blue, the very center is yellow, and then the bottom right corner is also blue or there may be more images shown on that see there are ones that are simpler and there are ones that are a little bit more difficult and that will come into play and score it when you are ready to start the game everybody is going to look at the board in front of them and the cards from their perspective and they're going to start moving these discs again only sliding them never picking them up and moving them outside of the board but to try to create the patterns that are on the cards. When somebody has created one of the patterns that's on the cards, they say Flash. Yeah, we're very into the Flash Gordon theme song in this house. Um, Just just because of this. I'm pretty sure it's... Oh, Daniel and I were already into it. It's it's cool. Um, So they say Flash and they take the card, which means that pattern is now no longer available for anybody who is also working on it to, uh, to complete and get any points. So now you've got a new pattern that you can work on. Sometimes it's one that you're almost to. Sometimes it's one that you are so far from you can't even imagine (laughs) getting there. But you've got two other options. Like I said, there are three piles. You're going to keep going, keep doing this until all the piles run out of cards. Then everybody's going to count up the number of cards they have. The simpler ones are worth one point. The more complex ones that had more requirements to be able to be claimed have a little icon in the corner that indicates that they're worth two points. So you know which ones are worth two points when you're taking them. You add up your score, and whoever has the most points wins. Oh, oh wait. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Uh, La Scorpion Masque is on fire right now. We <laughs> Not like actual fire, metaphorical fire. We talked about Stay Cool. We both really, really enjoyed that as much as we also loathed playing it because it's so stressful in a way. Um, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Decrypto, which was a few years ago, and I, we've talked about that a good bit. Um, and this one is just another hit in a terms of a quick, fun party-ish game that's not just a party game. I feel like it's really interesting because this is a fast-playing, pattern-matching, exciting party game that you're playing with up to four players, and that's really, really fun. Yeah, I mean, it is fun, but it's also super fun at one. I played this a ton as a solo game, Mm -hmm. and I really loved it. Yeah, so we will definitely have to come back and talk about the solo stuff um, in a little bit. But did you find any kind of like interesting things that came up when we were playing this with uh, like multiplayer about yeah. like differences of player count, stuff like that? Well, I mean, I think it worked fine at at mul- all the different m- multiple player counts. Yeah. It, you're never going to play this game with more than four. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you're going to have nine people all trying to compete for the same three cards. With four, there's enough different things that you can go for that you're not going to be absolutely ruined if somebody takes the card that you're going for. Mm-hmm. I also found that even people who thought they weren't going to be great at this game by the end of the game, we're definitely getting a handle on how to maneuver stuff. And even if they weren't as good at it, mm-hmm. there are definitely times where you just luck into being closer to a pattern than everybody else. Maybe you just completed a pattern and it had you put all of your yellow pieces on the left side of the board. And then you remove it and the next card says, okay, all the yellow pieces need to be on the right side of the board now. Yeah, It's just going to take you more moves to get there than me if one of my yellow pieces is already on the right side of the board. So it, it's a nice fairness in getting getting those cards sometimes. And there's enough diversity of the things you're trying to make that it never feels like, oh, I can't do 
any of this at all. And one thing I really, really appreciated about that is having multiple stacks of cards. And I think three is the right amount because that's enough for you to process and see all the different patterns and just be able to check. Oh, I'm not going to do that one. I still got these two options. It's the right number of options for you to be looking at at any given time. And like, realistically, I wonder if you could get a second set of this game and, you know, to shuffle all the cards so some of the cards would be duplicated, but then you'd be able to play with like six. I don't want to do that. Fair enough. But I guess you technically technically could but don't you don't need to do it because the gameplay is quick enough that you can rotate people in and out um, as much as you need at that point you'd be dealing with not being able to see the cards right okay good point um i also really appreciated having those um the two star ones at the kind of percentage that they were i think it's probably you know 20 to 25 percent of the deck is those special two star ones so when one came up if it was something that was just like, I can't even process that, you still have other options to go at. And it's pretty rare that two two stars came up. It happens every now and then. But I feel like, for the most part, it's a good balance of difficulty that will come out with the 30 or so cards that you're playing with. Mm -hmm. And I really just enjoyed having the flexibility to decide what I wanted to do at any particular time of the game. And to your point earlier, it's kind of interesting in a way that Like you said, people that, oh, I'm not going to be good at this game, were able to kind of find something that worked and something that kind of helped them get through, which is another thing we talked about in Stay Cool, a game which I fully expected to hate, but found different ways to make myself really enjoy it. And I'm wondering if that might be another special kind of knack that La Scorpion Masque has. Maybe they have a way of making these games seem like, oh, this is going to be, you know, it's trouble for a lot of people, but then find a way to make the game so that it is fun for everyone. Yeah. Now, if you don't like being rushed, this game is is not for you, though. Mm -hmm. Like, there are some people who just don't like being rushed at all, ever. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess what I would say to that is, if you don't like being rushed, is one player right for you? Oh, no, no, absolutely that, not. Well, there's no timer in one player. There right? is a def. They didn't put a timer in the box, but there is a timer in oh, one player. OK, that's um, my one so, component gripe with this game. Fair. You have played <laughs> all of the uh, one player stuff. So tell us a little bit about the one player mode and how that plays differently. OK, well, in the one player mode, obviously, only you get a board. You get the same board. You get the same set of eight little discs that mm-hmm. you're going to be sliding around. But you take the cards and you flip them over. The backs of the cards do not have patterns. They only have a single character which is the color of one of your discs so you know maybe the little blue guy maybe the little fire red guy Mm -hmm. and then they have a shape drawn around the character you are going to lay those out in a three by three grid we're doing a lot of three by three grids this episode yeah you're going to lay them out in a three by three grid and you are going to start a four minute timer again not included in the box you have to have a cell phone or a microwave or an oven or a watch that has a timer on it. <laughs> microwave nothing for four minutes. <laughs> you you know you can set a timer on a microwave without turning it on, right? Yeah, I know, but that's not funny. Cool. These are my jokes. They're not uh, funny, too. <laughs> you can get some sand timers from another game if you don't have that. Hmm. Whatever. Most people can just set their phone. And you're going to set a timer for four minutes. Then you're going to attempt to complete one of the rows in the three by three pattern of cards that you've laid out rows or columns when you have matched that row or column so maybe the top row is blue blue red and i get my grid to have blue blue red i'm going to take the little marker disc that that comes with the game and i'm going to put it next to that row meaning i can't complete that row again without completing another row and i'm going to take the pile of cards I can replace all of the cards that share one of the shapes in the row I've completed. So if the first one is a square, the second one is a circle, and the third one is a circle, I can cover the second and third. Mm -hmm. Or if they're all different, you only get to cover one. Then you're going to keep moving your discs around trying to complete another row or column. And then once you do, you'll move that marker token. That's the one you can't duplicate now. And you'll cover up some more cards. When the timer runs out, you count the number of cards that are left in your deck. Mm. that haven't been used to cover up any portion of the grid. And depending on how many cards you have left, it will give you a score in sort of the same way that like Letter Jam gives you a score or anything like that where you're the cooperating gives you, you a score. So yeah, you are given a score based on how many cards you did not use. So essentially how much progress you've made. So you need to strategically think not only about what are the positions of your little discs in your setup, but also of what is most valuable to complete 
based on matching symbols around your colors. If there's a row that all have the same symbol, you want to do that one because it's going to get three cards out of the way in the same amount of time that a row that has all different symbols, you're only going to get one card out of the way. I have no idea why I thought this that solo mode didn't have a timer. Obviously, it has a timer. Yeah. Past me, you're dumb about that thing. Yeah. It's super fun in solo mode, though. Yeah, so that's really interesting to me, and I think that's another awesome feature of Flash 8, is that it has a the you know the two to four player mode but then the solo mode is significantly different with the same set of components using the same fundamental idea of the slide puzzle i really really like that kind of implementation of a solo puzzle rather than just be a uh, play against dummy card or something yeah, like that yeah you couldn't that. really do this against a dummy player you can just like <laughs> randomly move the other yeah but uh, yeah it's cool and i think that it was a surprising get to then have that additional solo mode in there. Like we were sold on this as a multiplayer game. And then you found out that that had that solo that actually turned out to be pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it also, it took like two minutes to learn the solo mode, which Mm -hmm. was really what got me into it in the first place. I don't play a ton of solo games, but I saw it and I was like, Oh, this game is fun. And the solo rules are real quick. Mm -hmm. I bet I could just knock that out a couple of times. And I did, I played it like three games in a row. Boom. And Um, it was fun. I am giving this one my seal of Game Night Forever, or Game Night Bag Forever, assuming that we ever have Game Nights ever again in this world we live in. Is that a seal that we have? I mean, I've kind of always said, like, oh, this is a game that will live in the game bag. Yeah. And this is one of those games. And I kind of want to just, like, say this is a a Game Night Bag Forever kind of game. Because it's so quick and easy to teach. It's a lot of fun. It gets people energized. It fits a different group of player count. And it has a really short play time, too. So you can get people in and out. And it just kind of is a... It's also a great... Um, oh, you've never played games before? Check this out. This is the thing you can actually play, and I can teach you in 30 seconds. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Flash 8, it is now available stateside. It is from Le Scorpion Masqué. And just to say this, if you can get the English rules and you need to buy a French copy, that should not be a problem. There is no language in this game. A very good point. Yeah. So the rules are in whatever language you buy, but there are no words in any of the components. Cool. Flash 8, go get it. All right. While you're doing that, um, during this break, you can go onto your favorite online retailer and or the Les Scorpion Mask website or, uh, I don't know, call up your local game store and get some of those games. But we're going to take a quick break and come back and talk to you about shopping in Bargain Quest. In Arcana Rising, the upcoming Kickstarter from Grey Fox Games, you are a spellcaster looking to prove your mastery and ascend beyond mortal form. You've carefully prepared your magic, chosen which arcane arts to focus on, built up powerful combinations, even decided whether the risks of dangerous blood magic are worth the potential rewards. But strong magic is not enough if you ignore the phases of the moon, which dictate the arts, which are rising in strength in those whose time is not yet at hand. Will you unleash the perfect spells right on cue to take the victory over competing casters? Check out Arcana Rising on Kickstarter now from Grey Fox Games. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. So our six-pack review this week is Bargain Quest with the Black Market Expansion. Bargain Quest is a 2017 release from Renegade Games, and the Black Market Expansion is a 2019 release, also from Renegade Games. Mm -hmm. And it plays two to, I believe, eight players with the expansion uh, in 30 to 60 minutes. The designer is Jonathan Ying with art by Victoria Ying. This is a game of drafting, hero equipping, and monster battling, but most importantly, of getting your moneying. Yeah, you're going to get that money from all them heroes in Bargain Quest. Yep. Yeah, um, I feel weird that we're a little late to the party on this one, being a 2017 release. More than a little late, yeah. Um, But I have been kind of eyeing this one for a while. I had a chance to play it at uh, the Gaming Hoopla back in, wow, was that this year? No. No, that was last year. Okay. Okay. Time was it e- last year? Time, yes, it was okay. last year. At least it was last year. Time doesn't exist, but Bargain Quest still does. But I've been wanting to get a copy of it, but I've just kind of been like, mm, eh, mm, eh. And then um, I actually was able to do a trade with somebody who lives up in Asheville, which is the reason, well, not the only reason we were up in Asheville that particular day and played Control. Um, but I did the trade, and I'm like, oh, sweet. And it came with a black market expansion. So awesome. Thank you for trading that one over to us. And I fully intended this one to just be a, oh, we'll play it once or twice. We'll probably talk about it recent plays but we got to the point where we played this enough we're just like hey there's enough in here let's do a full review of this one so if you have played bargain quest you're gonna hear all of our talk about it if you haven't played bargain quest you will also hear that talk about it but i will go into the telling of the game part anew okay so 
In Bargain Quest, you are a fantasy shop owner. I am a fantasy shop owner. Not a shop that sells fantasies, but a shop in a fantasy world that is selling equipment to adventurers. Technically a little bit of both. <laughs> I guess it is a little bit. Yeah, okay. But anyway, you are a fantasy shop merchant, and you are going to try to display wares to attract special heroes into your shop, and then you're going to try to sell them other wares you have that will increase their armor and attack strength and maybe add some other fun side effects. Once you've done on that selling stage, the heroes will go out and battle the monster of the round. There are three rounds of monsters. And if they have enough strength, that's awesome. They do a damage. And you get reputation because you sold stuff to that hero that helped them slay the mighty beast. The reputation is stars that you'll get. They're little tokens. Points. They're victory points, yeah. And also, if you've beefed up that hero enough that they are able to defend themselves from the onslaught of the monster, then you get another reputation point. Good for you. Convenient. Yes. But if they don't, uh, they die and they just get shuffled back into the deck. But it's fine. You got their money. They don't get shuffled into the deck. Uh, sorry. They get shoveled into the discard pile. Not even shuffled. You just put them down there. They get, they're dead. You don't, it doesn't matter what happens to them. Thank Fine. <laughs> so once uh, that hero is gone, new heroes will come out to take their place and you will start a new round where you're attempting to get more money, so on and so forth. At the end of the game, your points are these prestige victory points. And also you get one point per $10 you have in your coffers, which hopefully is a good bit because you will need to make a lot of money to win this game. Money! In terms of actual gameplay mechanics, every round of the game, you're going to be dealt item cards. You're going to receive four of them, um, and then you're just going to draft them around and pick the ones that you want to have representing your shop. Each of the item cards matches any number of the four guilds of heroes. There's red, yellow, green, and blue. You know, your typical four colors. I don't know. They're mage and fighter and etc. classes. They also have a cost, which is how much you will sell them to that hero. They have a name. They have a you know a fun picture or something like that. And then, obviously, at the bottom, they have the important stats of how much armor and how much attack that card will provide. There are some negative numbers in there, but that's kind of just specialty edge cases. But generally, your cards are going to be used to beef up these heroes. The cards also sometimes underneath the banner of all the different guilds have a number of hearts, and those hearts represent the attractiveness of the card. After you've done all of your drafting, uh, you're going to look at your cards and you're going to choose one of your cards to put into your display window. This generally is a card that you want to have a lot of those hearts if you want to choose a hero first. And then any other cards you have are going to go into your shop and you'll be able to sell them later on. This is an interesting moment in the game because the card that you place into your display generally cannot be sold to a hero that comes into your shop. It's compounded even more by the fact that when we are in the uh, hero gaining shopping stage, we're going to evaluate who has the most hearts in their display window, and then they're going to have their first pick of the heroes. The caveat there is the hero must have a guild symbol that matches guild symbols of what's in your window. So if there's three different yellow symbols out there and you don't have a yellow shop in your window, then you don't get to get any of those heroes and you're sad about it. So you're going to want to choose that card to both be very attractive and match something in that center zone of heroes so that they come into your shop. You're going to have one hero per turn or per player, basically. Uh, but at the same time, if you can kind of match everything based on what's in your hand to sell, you don't have to worry about getting at somebody early because you might be able to get anybody at all. After everybody has had a chance to claim a hero if they have hearts, then it'll fall to anybody that doesn't have hearts based on symbols as well. And if you're at left at the end and you didn't have any hearts and you didn't have a symbol that matches anybody that's in the center, um, you know, hero line, that hero comes into your shop anyway. And you do get one hero per player in this game leftovers yeah once they're in your shop you're going to sell them up to whatever amount of money they have all heroes come with a specific set of money and then as they battle the monsters each round if they do survive they get additional treasure and money from that particular monster you can sell them as much as you want within reason as long as it matches a symbol that is on their card of the four different guilds and then we will go adventuring Adventuring is kind of uh, interesting because everybody will get a little tiny card flipped up in front of their hero that will adjust some of their values. Maybe you'll get a plus one, plus one, or maybe it'll be a minus one on uh, defense, or maybe it'll be a special condition. If this hero survives, they get an extra star or something like that. And then in turn order, um, every player is going to go have their hero take a strike at the monster. If you are able to wound the monster, 
Good job, A+. plus. Uh, you get a star. If your hero survives, you get a star. The shop gets a star, I mean. And if they live, they go back into the center. If they die, they go into that discard pile, like I said earlier. Each monster's hit points is very simple, the number of players in the game. So if, on the first round, every player deals a wound to the monster, you've defeated the first monster right away. Good for you. Clap, clap, clap. We're very pl- proud of you. But if you don't, that monster will survive to the next round. Dag. Depending on if you defeated the monster or if the monsters li- lived, you'll get a different number of coins onto the heroes that survive. They'll go back into the center. You flip up more heroes, yada, yada, yada. Between the adventure phase and the uh, reset phase, you get to go shopping, basically upgrading your shop to either hire some employees that are either, you know, special buffs or one time use or... Or do some shop upgrades, like increasing the storage capacity of your display, or maybe the storage capacity of cards you're able to save from round to round. And then in the Black Market expansion, there's another feature you can buy a card that allows you to access the Black Market, which is a side deck of cards with wacky fun conditions and powers and stuff that you have access to at the beginning of that drafting stage. We'll talk about that more as we go on. After each round, you'll do a reset. You can store however many number of cards you have available from your storage updates. The Your usual is one card. You'll do another drafting, so on and so forth, until you get to the third and final monster. Once that monster is defeated, the game ends. But if all of your heroes are defeated before that, the game also ends and everybody loses. So it behooves you to be a team player and pick the right heroes for everybody so that everybody can sell stuff so we can defeat these dang monsters and save the town. But at the same time, you also really want to sell all the stuff to that guy that's got 40 bucks on him and he's just dumb and it doesn't matter if he dies. You got his 40 bucks. That's all that matters because that's four points and four points could win you the game. And that's Bargain Quest, pretty much. And at the end of it, you have a flag and a veil. I don't know. That's not in the game. It's not in the game, but it seems thematically appropriate for the time period. Yeah. So now the time period is now. You may eat a ale. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So anyway, like I said, I've been wanting to play this game more for a while now. We've had a chance to. And I would like to say start off with the typical place of art and components. I think the art's fantastic in this game. I think that that is one of the most noticeable points um the art is done by victoria ying which is jonathan ying's sister so the sister of the of the designer and she is a animator for disney so everything has that really clear whimsical uh super colorful fun look to it and i just adore the art i will say that there is a difference in the sort of the clarity of the shop art particularly between the base game and the expansion this was something okay. that was pointed out by someone we were playing with and i absolutely couldn't stop seeing it once i was once it was pointed out to me yeah like the the art while it is bright and really nice in both of the the components in the initial game things are not nearly as crisp mm. whereas in the up or the expansion components they were a little bit more outlined they were a little bit more crisp so that was just a difference in art okay it's not that one was particularly worse than the other but it was pointed out to me and i feel like the need to tell it to everybody else Mm. no it, it makes a lot of sense um the shop boards themselves are kind of a foldable um cardboard board that you get to play and they're perfectly functional i think they don't matter at all i do really like that they're all unique art as well so you have eight completely different unique shops in this with the expansion Um, i think honestly the biggest component quality that we're going to talk about in this game is dullness of color we all we have a a couple card problems the, the text stuff yeah um the text is very small which, you know, if you're playing with six or five or six players is going to be a pain because there is a lot of text to read on the hero cards and on the items and on the upgrades and the, you know, employees and stuff like that. And also there's just not a whole lot of contrast on the text. It's black text on kind of a scrollish brown background. And then your uh, your symbols on the side there that are the different guilds, they're kind of faded as well. So it's not like super bright colors. Yeah. Yeah. I was routinely playing this game upside down. Yeah. Uh, All the heroes were upside down to me. All the, well, the items were in my hand, but all the employees were upside down and the monster text was all upside down. And that's going to happen to half the players at any table. Um, It was very difficult, if not impossible, to read the small text on the heroes between games. Mm -hmm. Now, after a couple of games, 
I got used to some of the heroes, but there are also some heroes that we never even played with, so I wouldn't be used to them even after this many games. You'd still need somebody who had it right side up to read to read that that special ability text to you, because especially for the heroes and the monsters, it's very important. Mm-hmm. Also, the icon or the cards often reference the guild icons. Yes. In the card text, all of the guild icons which are all different symbols. I will say that this is colorblind friendly in the sense that all of the guild colors are different, but all of the guild symbols are also different. But in the card text, they're all black. I don't like, it's so strange that that wasn't a colored symbol because that's such a a clear signifier of what each of the ones are. It also distinguishes them from the game mechanic symbols, like the attack and defense symbols, which are black on all of the cards. Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at the card and I see that there's a colored symbol, I'd know that that was something different other than attack or defense. Also, you talk about there being red, blue, yellow, and green in this game. (laughs) Those symbols are brown. They're brown as the day is long. Okay, I definitely saw yellow, but I understand so, that we all have different rods and cones. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know. Like, my main problem was that I couldn't read the dang cards when they yeah. were upside down and, and a couple of feet away from me, which, good for them. They put enough text on the cards to properly explain all the abilities, which mm. I do like, with a few exa- or with a few exceptions, rather. there is There is one particular employee that i was misunderstanding for a couple of games just because Mm -hmm. of of a little bit of clarity but most of them are very well explained but that means that the text is very small because there's a good bit of it and it's difficult to read yeah um everything else in there is your standard you know game components you have little uh, punch board tokens for your money and for your points perfectly fine everything else is totally fine uh would love would have loved a little more clarity on the cards in terms of just contrast um but otherwise i think everything else is great and it's enhanced by that really excellent art i just feel like it's it's it feels fun and kind of a whimsical kind of feel to the fantasy world and there was nice representation in the heroes oh yeah I mean, the monsters were all monsters. They were representative <laughs> of monsters, but mm-hmm. the heroes were all humanoid and, and the they were nice too. and nicely yeah. representative. Yeah. Um, so learning from the rule book, it was super easy for me. Uh, granted, there's an asterisk on that because I did learn from somebody else. But it was the kind of thing where when we had game night over, um, I just opened it up. I read both rule books in about 10 minutes. I'm like, OK, cool. I know exactly how to f- function this for our player count and also with the black market stuff in. It wasn't terribly complicated. Um, obviously, you know, like any game, you mess up a rule once or something when you're playing and then you play again you get it right so on and so forth but i didn't really have any challenge with it um learning from a teach how was it for you it was it was fine like you taught me the game and then i understood the game yeah it was fine you did good (laughs) well i it's more of a learning from the teach in terms of the game provides enough information no i i understand yeah It, it was a it's not a super complicated game it was reasonable the only thing that i think we and i don't know if this was just me or everybody uh the end steps if you defeat the monster you don't flip up the next monster until Mm -hmm. several steps later which felt a little weird because there wasn't a monster out there yeah uh but somebody at the table can be like hey don't touch yeah and it i guess it makes sense in gameplay because those monsters do have global side effects Mm -hmm. and if they open up too early obviously issues um i will say a few things that make the learning and the teach really helpful on this game are component uh advantages as well everybody's player board has at the bottom of it a order of each of the six steps so Mm -hmm. you know exactly what phases and back of the rule book very clear step by step everything that's you know each step so easy to set that up at the side of the table if you were the game leader just so you can keep a, a focus on where everything is oh i forgot to say this components thank you Thank you, thank you for having a clear list of everything in the box it's fair. with pictures, especially because the difference between different uh, type, different types of cards is different colors on the back of the cards. Which is, yeah, maybe not the greatest choice considering it's like gray and, and black. black and dark green. <laughs> uh, there is that. Again, but, hey, maybe at least, make the cards white next at time. At least they gave me a list of what's there. True. 
Uh, I did like that list at the bottom that you were talking about that looks kind of like file tabs because it allowed me to look at a card and if it says at the end of the adventure step or during the storage step Mm -hmm. or during whatever other step, during the shopping step, I could look and be like, oh, okay, we do this, then we do this, then this happens, then this happens. And it was really interesting to plan out because if you think that an effect is going to happen during a different time, it would have a very different effect on the game. But all of the times when I looked at a card and it said during such and such, and it always did say that, Mm -hmm. I could look at my little player board and say, oh, that's the last thing. I can't use it in the way I was expecting. I'll use it in the way that they mean me to do it. And I have planned for it. And I don't feel like I was like my opportunity was robbed from me because I had the information to plan, Mm -hmm. which was nice. And I feel that this is something that Bargain Quest does exceptionally well. It does a very good job of teaching you when different effects will occur and also giving you a bunch of different things in the game that will reinforce when those effects occur. Like you said, at the bottom of the board there, it's clearly signpost. This says storage step. That means that. Um, I really, really appreciate having that extra care taken into design. I feel like that's something that a lot of games that were Kickstartered, um, this was a game that was Kickstarted and self-published before Renegade picked it up as well, um, that a lot of those kind of games kind of forget or miss. And I just really appreciate that extra level of signposting along Mm -hmm. the way. Um, So in terms of gameplay, uh, this game's got drafting. I love drafting. It's fun. And I want to talk about the drafting itself and the decisions that you're making as you're going through that card draft. Because as we said, you're really focusing on two different things, cards that you can sell to the heroes and cards that will attract the heroes. And I find that a really interesting approach to drafting because obviously you can save a card or two between rounds, but the bulk of what you do every round is going to be new and it's going to be coming to you from that draft. Mm, You missed the third kind of drafting, hate Hate drafting. drafting. (laughs) Okay, fine. In this game, it is somewhat important. Like, I'm going to take this just so nobody else has it for sure. Yeah, because if you've got a card that is very likely to attract a certain hero, even if you aren't planning to attract that hero, if you don't want somebody else to get that power, it sometimes behooves you to take a card that may not be the most useful to you Mm -hmm. and keep somebody else from having it just so that you get a better pick of heroes or so that you get better cards down the line where maybe you're looking for cards to be passed to you you know if you've taken a card that's really really powerful and would lead another player in a certain direction if you keep that maybe they'll be a little bit more swirling in the wind on what they're drafting yeah Another thing I will say about this, the item deck is pretty large. Oh, yeah. It's probably like 100-something cards. And I find it interesting that there's a really strong balance of the cards you always get, like torches or an axe. But also, there's an interesting number of fun cards sprinkled in there as well. And the balance is really good that very rarely did I get... Like I draw up my, you know, first four cards and this is all bland stuff or all basic utilitarian. There's always a little bit of that fun sprinkled in. And then that makes every step of the drafting kind of interesting to me because you're drafting your your fun stuff first and then you're getting your utility. Oh, this is just a plus one, but I'll take it. And I really appreciated that balance of the deck because it made the draft, I feel like, worthwhile at almost every step obviously you're going to get sometimes two cards and they're exactly the same and this is like a dumb draft or oh well like obviously not going to take this card kind of stuff but for the most part it was a fun draft all the way through there are a couple of interesting things about the draft that you didn't just point out one of which Mm -hmm. is the way that the black market cards work yes so let's bring that in they are added into the player who gets to draw them's hand at the beginning of the draft Mm mm-hmm And then they pass with their hand around to the other players if they're not drafted. Yeah. So if you get a black market card that you don't necessarily need because you don't have the the saved cards to attract that particular hero. Or if they're just bad. Some of the black market cards suck. Or if they're just bad, but that wasn't the point I'm making. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You may pass them to me and maybe I'm working with something that that works really well for. Maybe I saved two red cards last turn and that card that has a red symbol that you didn't care about 
now that's really useful to me mm -hmm. and I can take that. So even if you didn't do the black market upgrade, you're going to see some of those interesting black market cards throughout the game if you're playing with somebody else who did. Yeah. And I'm really glad that the copy we got had that added in because I feel like it's a good expansion piece, but not necessary to win. In fact, I don't think I've ever won with it and I go black market every single time. Maybe there's a lesson there. Hmm. Mm, it's that you have to spend points to get the black market upgrade. Yeah, you have to spend a point to get the black market upgrade. But it, it adds in another avenue of fun without bogging down the game or even more diluting that item deck to a ridiculous amount by adding another 50 cards into it. It's its own deck and you play with them as you choose. Yeah. Um, so after you're doing drafting, obviously you're doing that kind of decision of what's going in my window. And I feel like this is going to be another interesting kind of discussion point because how often in... Uh, games that you played do you feel you needed to front load your window with cards with hearts on them very rarely yeah um unless we were going into a round where almost all the heroes were very similar which did not often happen there's enough variability in the heroes mm -hmm. especially with the black market expansion that I often saw maybe two, at most, three heroes had the same symbol, but heroes can have either one or two symbols on them. Mm -hmm. So if you've got three heroes with the same symbol, some of them are going to have a different symbol. And yeah. very often, I looked at what was out there, and I didn't feel the need to necessarily get one specific hero. Now, almost always, there was one that I did not want. Yeah. And I would stock my window based on that. But a lot of the times I just threw something with all four symbols in my window on the off chance that somebody else put something in their window that was aiming for a certain hero and they didn't get to go first. And then they get kicked to the back of the list because mm -hmm. if if you put out a card that only has a blue symbol and it has three hearts because you really want the blue hero mm -hmm. and Daniel puts out a card that has four <laughs> hearts and, and he blue. takes the blue hero. I feel sad. Yes, you feel sad. But also, if there's no other blue hero, you feel like you can't take hero till the end of the hero drafting round. Yeah, very true. So it very often, to me at least, seemed like it was, if you weren't angling towards a specific thing based on the cards you drafted, you're better off just putting something that has a lot of symbols because then you'll get to go before anybody who gets kicked to the end of the round. Mm -hmm. And you'll... Just get whatever's there. Also, and this is, I know we'll talk about player count later, but particularly true at lower player counts, I often didn't have, a, or at two players, I didn't have a lot of extra cards. Yeah. Because you can only save one, probably two, possibly three cards from round to round. Like the most upgraded your shop can get, you're saving three cards from round to round. Mm -hmm. And then you're drafting four or in a two player game, six new cards you don't have a ton of cards. And if you're able to sell them to heroes, I mean, selling three, sometimes four cards to a hero in a round is not out of the question. Yeah. It's fairly standard to sell like two or three cards. So I'm not going to have a ton of extra stuff. I don't want to waste putting a good card in my window because then I can't sell it because unless you have the specific employee, just like real life, not like real life at all. You can't sell what's in the window. Yeah. I, it's interesting in a way that I feel so much about the selling to heroes step and the display step ties back to the draft. And this is something that I really have come to appreciate about Bargain Quest is that the different phases of the game are very discreet but they are all connected to the decisions you make in the draft. Mm -hmm. And that's a really fantastic way of making this game feel cohesive. Knowing that during the draft, I am looking at all of the heroes, I'm looking at their symbols, I'm looking at how much money they have, and every single time I get another card, I'm like, okay, I'm mentally budgeting this card to go to that hero if I do get them, but what's the plan B? And then also, once I get those cards equipped and sold, what's that hero going to be at to get me uh, stars in the adventure phase? It's a really fantastic kind of synergy there. You also need to pay attention to their special abilities, yes, too. Yes, that bit my ass a few times. It did do that. That's why I said it. Yeah. Um, there are some heroes that will cause you to discard cards from your hand. There are some heroes that can take extra cards than the mm -hmm. symbols that they are showing in their top left corner. There are some heroes 
to which it's very important that they live. There are some heroes that to which it's very important that they do a damage on the monster. So making sure that you take cards that are going to fulfill those abilities is also going to give you an advantage because a lot of times, like if it's a special requirement, it'll end up giving you an extra point. Yeah, and at the same time, the ones that I had the most fun with, there are heroes that will manipulate the cost of things in your shop. There's a hero that everything is $5 cheaper to them. There's a hero that you're allowed to lower the cost of something by 10 bucks uh, as a kind of a, a charity mm-hmm. thing. And there's a lot, like every one of the heroes has interesting things that will manipulate things when they come into your shop. And if you're me, make you discard a whole bunch of crap because you weren't paying attention. Mm. That did happen. Boo. But yeah, it's um, there's a lot of interesting variability that comes in depending on what you have set up in that particular game. And again, to bring it, bring it back to playing with the Black Market expansion, that adds in more heroes, meaning that you're not using the full deck of heroes in every game like you would in the base game. So you're setting up a different number of hero cards. And actually, after a number of plays, there's one or two heroes we still haven't seen. And I was as we were flipping through stuff, kind of working on the on tap, I'm looking, I'm just like, I never saw this card. This is wild. This it was the two heroes who are on the sides of the box so i like i had seen them before and i remember commenting particularly the one girl who's the young adventurer yeah she has a very i'm just happy to be here look on her face (laughs) and it was the side of the box that i was sitting on all of the plays and i was like oh it's fun but i wish she was in the game and then we were looking through the cards after oh she is in the game we just didn't see her come up yeah so like I am really excited about that, and I'm excited to see... I know that there's future expansions, and there's little miniature packs of cards as well. Super excited to see the different things that uh, will add more interesting stuff to this game as it goes on, because I feel like there's going to be a long tail on this one. Um, In terms of like fighting the monsters and stuff, that was always fun. I love the adventure card being flipped up that mitigates your hero in one way or another. And by love, I mean I love the mechanic... Oh boy, did I hate that card a whole bunch of times because it very often uh, removed two swords or something and made me immediately do nothing on a turn. Uh, But it's fun. It's fun kind of uh, randomness. And there are some employee cards that allow you to one time disregard Mm -hmm. that card. So if you are able to get one of those, those cards, you can plan to be a little bit closer to the numbers on the monster hit and monster defend threshold because you know well if i get a bad card i can just chuck this employee and yeah. we're good to go i'm not sure exactly how that works <laughs> did you just like push him out and the monster eats him or something maybe they distract the adventurer card yeah. which doesn't have a you know physical in-game thing anyway it allows you to plan <laughs> for that potential yeah downfall <laughs> Um, and then, obviously, I, I really like the way that they deal damage to the monsters in that everybody, or the monster doesn't die until the end of the round. So if you're a fourth player in a floor player game and you started the round with three wounds on that monster, you still get to do damage. And that's fantastic because I could see somebody d- designing this game making the choice of, oh, monsters die immediately when they get four hits or player count hits. And that would have sucked. Yeah. A lot, but you still have the opportunity to do a wound even if that monster's already passed its death threshold. I think that that is a really, really fantastic game choice. Yeah, I mean, this is where the bulk of your points comes from in the game. Like, you are going to get money points, Mm -hmm. and I I guess it's probably about equal in a a good game. You'll get about half your points for money, but you will need the half your points from doing hits and doing not deads. Uh, so it's really good that you don't miss an entire round of that if the monster dies mm-hmm. beforehand. Um, we also joked about earlier on that you all lose the game if you run out of heroes. Wasn't but a joke. It, well, yeah, but that never happened to us. And that was something that, honestly, I was a little worried about in the beginning. It we came, came real we close. We came real <laughs> close at one point. But I think that was also just kind of, it was early plays of the game. We didn't really... What, when was this? It was was this the, one of the most recent plays? No, no, but it was the specific monster. Oh, right. We had a monster that caused us to dis- discard a hero between every player's uh-huh. turn. So if we had had any more players, we were playing a three-player game, so we discarded three additional heroes each Fair round. Enough. If we had been playing a four-player game, we would have lost 
eight heroes so, that way. Yeah, depending on the <laughs> monster, obviously, I think the monsters are going to affect the game in interesting ways. Uh, but for the most part, like I was never afraid of not doing enough hits, and especially later plays of the game as we got more comfortable with how stuff would get mitigated with the adventure cards and also how we could synergize some fun item cards together. I feel like we got more effective at doing more damage quicker which is strange because nothing about the game changed except our understanding of it. And I didn't expect to get better at this game in that way. I think we also got better at drafting heroes that we could equip reasonably and not going after heroes that, while they may have on a base level looked more, more attractive or more valuable, like if we could not get them to get the points, then we didn't take them because it's just a waste of a hero and also all the cards that you're putting on them, and it's not going to get you those additional points to get that second half of your scoring. Yeah, you'll get the money, which is nice, but if you're not getting the points for doing a hit and doing a live, then you're not going to get anywhere near the amount of points you need. So you need to say, okay, that's a good valuable hero, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to let it go this round because I don't have what it would take to make that as valuable as it can be. Yeah. So... I feel like this is a natural segue into the next point we talk about a lot, which is replayability and variability. When I first played this game uh, back at um, the Gaming Hoopla a year or so ago, I'm like, okay, cool. This is cool. Um, I never and I didn't really think about like, I wonder how much variability there is in this game. But I would say after we've played this a number of times in our game group, especially having the black market expansion and knowing that there is more content available, I'm really impressed by how much variability and potential replayability there is in this game because we had games that depending on the monsters that come up feel very different yeah and and that's something that is really really added value to a game like this to me yeah the monster and not only the monster set but the combination of the heroes that are out at a specific time and the monster they're fighting Mm -hmm. and the cards that you're getting in that draft and like you said that item deck is large enough that it needs to be shuffled in two piles (laughs) and then shuffled together so like it's a lot of cards now they're not all unique there are a lot of torches like you said yeah but i like a torch a torch gives you five hit and it's got all the colors it's good i like a torch yeah but it feels different every time because you have different cards you can take different cards they mean different things to the hero pool because you've got a different hero pool with different colors and different abilities And those affect the monster differently because the monster has different powers and different thresholds to hit and also to attack you. Mm -hmm. I I don't see how this game would feel samey unless you got the same monsters over and over again. Yeah. And like, honestly, we had that happen in one of our games. We had um, at level three, the monster we'd already had once. We're like, oh, let's just pull a new one out. But I feel like that's enough of a change to make it feel a little fresher. That other one we got turned out to be a huge pain in the butt and was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, So we have played this at every player count two, three, four, and five. We haven't done six plus because... We will not. Because you're not allowed to have that many people. And also, like you said, we don't need to. Three to five, I feel like all felt very similar with obviously more, you know, downtime and more variability at five Um, But I feel like three to five players is always totally fine. Yeah, I mean, there's not a terrible amount more downtime at five because you're still doing the draft simultaneously Mm -hmm. and the shopping step where you're signing your cards simultaneously and your storage simultaneously. The only thing that is in turn order is the attacking and the upgrade buying. Yeah. So it didn't feel super bogged down at five. Yeah. But like again, going six, seven or eight, it's just like you don't need to do that because just even the, the card text everything would be some such a pain in the ass yeah this playing this at more than five players just seems like it's going to get overly complicated you're going to have too much stuff on the table yeah you're going to have too much like randomness on what heroes you end up getting because there's more people that can be drafting heroes before you yeah it'll be harder to plan for what you can possibly get i feel like this game two to five is where you should play it yeah It's nice to be able to do six if you really have to in a pinch, but I would definitely not recommend it. But now that we talked about three to six-ish, I want to talk about two-player because as a fan of drafting games, I am always kind of uh, a little 
anxious playing any kind of game with a big drafting component at two players. But I got to say, this actually worked really well at two. Hmm. Because I enjoy, in the two-player, there's quote-unquote advanced two-player rules where you're drafting six cards instead of four. You're getting to pick two heroes, and the monsters take twice as much damage. So it's basically a four-player game, but you're playing two amounts of heroes. But the thing that I really appreciated about it is that then when I was drafting, every drafting decision I made had that second level of which hero is this going to apply to if it doesn't work on my first one. And that was a really fun space to play in, and especially playing you and I after we had played this game a number of times with a bunch of people, it gave me another bit of kind of fresh play to it. And um, us being pretty familiar with it at that point, the game played like that. It was a snappy game. Agreed. I really like this at two players because, like you said, not only is it about what card is best for the heroes I have, but also how much money do those heroes have. Yeah. If I end up getting this card and I find something else that I want to sell to this hero that would max their budget, can I move it to my other hero? Oh, Probably not. I'm probably going to get a hero that doesn't have that symbol. How do I adjust what I'm going to put on my display so that I make sure that I get heroes that I can split these cards among nicely to get the most money? Mm -hmm. And when I invariably have no cards left, oh no, why do I not have any? (laughs) When you run out of cards, A, it feels really nice because you made the most use of your hand. You made all the money. But also it means you're going into the next round. With no plan, which is a little bit seat of the pants, but it's still fun. Like you still have enough information once you start doing that draft and seeing what's out there Mm. that it doesn't feel like it's completely off the rails, even if you are coming in fresh. So these are all big check marks, replayability, variability, player count, um, and a lot of other things that have been check marks. I want to talk about value on this game because this one kind of surprised me. I mean, you'd have to. It's Bargain Quest. Yeah. This game MSRP is for 40 bucks for the base game. You can obviously find it. At a bargain uh, for about 32 bucks online. Okay. Honestly, I would pay 40 for this game, uh, the base game, just straight up. Because yeah. I feel like the amount of variability and player count and all that stuff makes it worth that MSRP. So 32 bucks, that's a steal. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny to me that like the point we're at with games is I would pay what they're asking for it. And that's a great compliment. But it's well, true. Yeah. Like, I mean, true of anything. This like, is easily a $40 game. No problem. What's the expansion at? The black market expansion is 20 bucks, and obviously cheaper if you find it some places online. The next one, uh, next expansion that's coming is retailing for 25 And again, you can get it like 19 or something. And then the they have a bunch of little expansion packs that add in additional heroes or additional items, some fun stuff like that. And those range from five to ten bucks and come in a little tuck box. I meant the one we played with. Yeah, that, that one was twenty bucks. Sixteen if you find it at the bargain zone in the internet. But like I was just like really impressed with the value you get there, mm-hmm. especially when you add in those little contact packs. If you ever get to the point where you're just like, I want a little bit of flavor, a little bit of spice, you go spend five bucks for a whole new set of heroes. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. This is really, really smart positioning of this game in terms of value. Yeah, I like I like that value a lot. Mm-hmm. I think what we played is sixty dollars MSRP. You said uh, forty and twenty. 20 yeah, yeah, it's, that's sixty still. Um, <laughs> And I, I would pay $60 for this game. We played it a ton of times, and I still want to play it more. It's nice. Like, it is it is efficiently packaged, but I don't feel like it is a small game. Mm-hmm. When you set it out on the table, there's tons of cards in the box. Like, you're getting the value on components. Yeah, you're getting efficient. the value on fun. You're getting the value on strategy. Uh, yeah, easy, easy decision. And I think that sort of wraps up my thoughts on this game as a whole. There are... There's so much bounty in what it is and so much strategy and so much to attend to without being a heavy game. Just a nice, complex strategy that makes you feel like you're doing something smart when you do it that I really enjoyed this game. This I, There was never a moment, even when I didn't feel like I had the best turn, there was never a moment where I felt like I didn't do something that was helpful to myself. Bargain Quest is the kind of game that's always kind of been on my radar, but I've never really pushed to look into it. And it's the kind of thing that I had a chance to get this game in a trade, and it 
exceeded any potential value that I could have expected. And it's it's funny that it's a game with this theming that fits this particular niche, but I feel like the replayability, the variability, the player count advantages, the fantastic art, the ease of learning, and just the kind of the casual fun of playing this and the jokes that come out of it when we've been playing it with groups have far exceeded anything that I would have paid to actually buy this game. And I can't think of a greater thing to say about a game called Bargain Quest than, holy crap, this thing was a diamond in the rough. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how we feel about Bargain Quest, a 2017 release from Renegade. And I guess this is the part where we go to the on tap. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. For more information on the beers we chose to pair with today's game on tap, check out the show notes section at our website, draftmechanic.net. It's time for beers paired with Bargain Quest and the Black Market expansion, the 2017 and 2019 release from Renegade Game Studios. It plays two to six or eight players with the expansion in 30 to 60 minutes. Designed by Jonathan Yang with art by Victoria Yang, the drafting hero equip and monster battling, but most importantly, get the money in game. Okay, so hmm. when I went to do the on tap for this game, it was... Far more difficult than I anticipated. Quite the adventure, you say? Well, because so much of this game is themed around generic game ideas. Like, it didn't make any sense to be like, oh, hero and also monster Mm -hmm. or even like rogue and fighter and mage and whatever the brown one is supposed to be. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I think it's like druid or something. I don't know what it is. It's the brown one nice magic person yeah so i it didn't make any sense to have the hero theme be that because that's not what this game is about this game is about money Mm -hmm. this game is about how much does it cost and so on tap we are talking about beers that have a specific value in their name (laughs) we're gonna start from hoof-hearted brewing in marengo ohio $60 $60 nachos. That's expensive nachos. Well, just wait. It's a double IPA that is 8% ABV. It's a double IPA with Citra, Simcoe, and Eldorado hops. They also have a $120 nachos. Those are very expensive nachos. Which is a 12% triple dry hop triple IPA with Citra hops that is currently available on their web store. Ooh. I don't think I would buy nachos from anywhere but Nexus in uh, Albuquerque, New That's Mexico. That's true. They have the best nachos. They are a brewery that makes the best nachos. Holy moly. But that's not a beer called nachos. Those are actual nachos. Actual nachos. Hoofhearted actually has beer called nachos. Actual nacho farmer here. <laughs> anyway, up next from Other Half Brewing Company in Brooklyn, New York, USA, and apparently very soon in uh, Washington, D.C. They're opening a satellite location there, which is exciting. $100 soft serve, a fruited sour at 5.5% ABV. This is a fruited sour with soft serve ice cream powder, because why the heck not? Uh, also, vanilla and blackberry puree. I was not prepared to go into that. They put soft serve powder into this beer. I mean, all the descriptions say conditioned on soft serve, but the actual can says soft serve ice cream powder. You know, this is right up other half's alley. They do some weird stuff, and a lot of them have actually been fantastic. So, if you especially are able, their fruited sours, yeah. yeah. If you are able to acquire one hundred dollars soft serve, check mark. Next from Siren Craft Brewing in Wokingham, Berkshire, England, we have ten dollars shake. This is a fruited IPA that is six point five percent ABV in its latest incarnation. Mm. Is an IPA with mango, papaya, and passion fruit. And this has taken a few different forms every time they brew it. They brew it every, like, year or two because they, it is a, a Pulp Fiction reference and they like to do Pulp Fiction-themed beers. But the most recent incarnation was a 6.5% ABV uh, IPA with mango, papaya, and passion fruit. Nice. So check out their website to see when it will come around again and what the newest incarnation will be. Mm-hmm. And finally, the young upstarts from Greenville, South Carolina, the 8th State Brewing Company, which we have enjoyed a good number of times, but I think it's the first time they're making it on the podcast. Yeah, I think so. We have a beer that is called, and I kid you not, nine ninety nine Lobster Special. It's an English barley wine at 13% ABV. It is a collab with Evil Twin Brewing, Westbrook, Westbrook Brewing, and Edmunds Oast. Yes, that is a four brewery collaboration, which makes sense when I read the next sentence. This is a coconut butterscotch, no-bake, cookie, dessert-styled English barley wine with toasted coconut, peanut butter, butterscotch, and cocoa nibs. Once more for the people in the back, this is a coconut butterscotch, 
no-bake cookie dessert-styled English barley wine with toasted coconut, peanut butter, butterscotch, and cocoa nibs. I feel like they just put the no big cookie dessert style thing in there just to make it longer because that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything at all. Um, but what it did mean is this is a delicious beer. Yeah, we had we this enjoyed. one. Yeah. Eighth State is doing some weird and wacky stuff. So if you are in the upstate of South Carolina, highly encourage you to keep an eye on them. Uh, check out. They're doing a lot of collabs with a lot of breweries around the country. So keep an Usually eye on Usually not three at that. a time, though. Um, but yeah, like Eighth State's doing some. They're doing Imperial Seltzers right now. Like 10% seltzers. Because why? Because 8th State's doing it. They made a beer with Kool-Aid. That's just a vodka soda, right? Kind of, (laughs) yeah. They made a beer with Kool-Aid, Danielle. Remember that one? I do. It was good. That was... Anyway, 8th State Brewing, $9.99 Lobster Special. If you are looking for more information on any and all of these beers, I will tell you, you can go to the website draftmechanic.net or you can go to boardgames.beer, an actual real website that I pay real human money for. Either way, go click the show notes tab, and Danielle will have put links into the show notes for this episode, and you will get edu- edumacated. Or you can go to my untapped lists. Mm-hmm. My untapped username is laughs too easily. So if you are an untapped user, the easiest way to get to all of these lists is just to go to my profile, and they are all nicely laid out for you. You can click on the episode you want and go right to the beer. Yes, this is the way. Delete. <laughs> Danielle, in the beginning of the episode, you said you had a divisive hop primer for us. So perhaps it is time for that. Yeah, we're talking about Sriracha Ace hops this week. And this was sort of a sticking point for me because I was not a big fan of these. But I I really wanted to try a Sriracha Ace beer before I was able to do this hop primer. Mm -hmm. However, the one that we will talk about later that is sort of the forerunner in the U.S., had an interesting story <laughs> uh, that I'll get to. But first, let's talk about the hops themselves. This is a Japanese variety of hops that was invented by Dr. Yoshitada Mori. And he was working at the time at Sapporo Breweries. Sapporo, if you've seen any of the import stuff, even in like the grocery store, you're probably familiar with that name. Mm-hmm. This, brooding, this breeding program was created back in the late 70s, and it was looking for a hop that had the character of the noble hop saws, but had a higher alpha acid content. They bred the hop that became Sriracha Ace from saws hops, which are Czech, Brewer's Gold, which are Canadian hops that are propagated in England, and from Bake High Number 2 hops, which are Japanese hops. So these are quite the mix of different hops together that were bred together. I wonder why we never hear about Bake High uh, there was not a, a lot of information even in the sources that I use oh. um, with that when I was looking it up. Like one of my main resources, if you've ever clicked through on the show notes, is and it seems silly to say it is kegerator.com, mm-hmm. but they do amazing hop profiles on the history of hops. While a lot of other sites have information about the statistics and the uses of hops, kegerator.com does a really nice profile of how the hops came to be. And like the list just it was like they blended these hops i could not find any information on this one (laughs) um so yeah that's probably why we don't hear terribly much about it you'll also see that hops that are available in japan are not often available at the same time in the u.s so that may be makes sense anyway what they did get from blending all of these worldly hops together did have a higher alpha acid than Saw's hops do, and it had a similar cohumulone level, so the bittering would have been, like, about the same, like, that that portion of the bittering would have been about the same level, which is what they were going for. However, they also got a lot of odd flavors, so they ended <laughs> up not using this hop for what they intended it to. The flavors that are in Sriracha Ace hops are a strong lemon flavor and aroma, You have a dill flavor. You have a coriander or cilantro flavor. Those are the same thing, if you didn't know. Wait, what? The coriander is the seeds and cilantro is the leaves. Hey, everybody, I've learned something new today here. Oh, dear. Look, I'm sorry. Oh, if you were closer, I'd pat you on the head. I'm glad I'm far away. Uh, And it has some tea flavor and the backbone is sort of an oaky. I also saw the description of the flavor as saying it had a dust flavor in it, which, hmm... My grandfather was a woodworker. I know exactly what that flavor is. Right. But like, why? Don't sell that. Don't sell that it tastes like dust. Look, I just learned that coriander and cilantro are the same thing. Maybe dust is the new hot thing in uh, gastronomic. Maybe. Uh, Yeah. So Sapporo made this hop 
commercially available in 1984. And they started growing it in Japan and China. And it was still very weird and it remained very small time and not a lot of people were using it to brew a lot of anything. In 1994, the USDA got some of it and got some of the rhizomes and they did some research on it and they planted some at Oregon State University Hop Research Center Farm in Corvallis. It just stays in their system. It's in their... Uh, their hop cultivar collection for another 12 years. Oof. Nope, I did the math bed, eight years. And in 2002, U.S. hop grower Darren Gamache of Virgil Gamache Farms picked Sirachi Ace out of the USDA hop cultivar collection. His farm had a history of bucking the trends in hop usage and planting varieties that other farms would just avoid. So he finds this Sirachi Ace hop in the USDA hop cultivar collection, and he's like, I need that on my farm, even though nobody in the U.S. is using it. He plants it, and four years later, in 2006, it becomes commercially available in the U.S. So between 1984 and 2006, it was commercially available in Asia, but not in the U.S. So again, like I was saying, maybe that's why we don't know a whole ton about Big High Hops. During the 2007 to 2008 hop shortage, craft breweries without long-term hop contracts started to scramble to look for things that had high alpha acids to substitute for the hops that they could no longer get. (laughs) And one of these replacements was Sriracha Ace. Keep that time frame in mind because when we come back to talking about the sort of forerunner on U.S. Sriracha Ace beers, that date will make a lot of sense. So I was talking about the the sort of weird flavors. The dill flavor is a lot of what people sometimes have an issue with. It can come off as an off flavor. Also, if the hops are not stored properly, they can have buttery, buttery off flavors, which if you're thinking about beer and I say butter to you, your first thought is probably diacetyl, which is not a great thing to have in your beer. People, people are not pleased when they do. Butter is for popcorn, not so for beer. If you're having this increased chance of having a buttery off flavor, that can sort of under that can sort of explain why, even though this is a hop that is available and is used in the US, it is not like it's not your leading premier hop. It can be used as a dual purpose hop, so it can be used for aroma and also for bittering, but it is more often used for bittering. When it is added early in the boil, which is what you would do for a bittering hop, you may lose some of that dill flavor, which, again, that's the thing that some people have an issue with. So that's probably good. So you're saying it's no big dill to lose some there? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes, got it in. But there's enough of the oil that creates the lemon flavor that you may actually still get some of the lemon flavor coming through the boil, which is kind of weird. Like a lot of the times we talk about bittering hops. When you put the hops in, you get the bitterness from the alpha acids, but you don't get a lot of the other, like, strong flavors coming through. So the fact that this lemon is in there strong enough that it comes through, even if you add it early in the boil, is interesting about this hop. If you add it late in the boil or in the dry hopping, you get a wider gamut of flavors, so you'll get that whole list that I gave you earlier, including possibly the dust. (laughs) If you're looking for the science, the acid breakdown is it is 11.5 to 16% alpha acids, 6 to 7.5% beta acids, and 23 to 28% cohumulum. The lemon and coriander flavors make it frequently used in saisons and wheat beers because those flavors go really nice together. But the fact that it has such a high alpha acid, which again was what they were going for originally, Mm -hmm. means that you can also use it in pails or IPAs. If you're looking for a beer that is Sriracha Ace hops only in the hop profile, the U.S. beer that almost like the the beer that people will say is the U.S. beer for this is Sriracha Ace Saison from Brooklyn Brewing Company. This came out in 2009. So right after that 2007, 2008 scramble, when people were putting this beer, it came out in 2006. People are starting to use it 2007, 2008, 2009. We get Brooklyn Sriracha Ace Saison. And it is, like, if you look up Sriracha Ace beer, this is what you get. Like, yeah. it is it is the standard on this beer. <laughs> what I was saying earlier was that there was a funny story that goes along with this is I had got, this used to be pretty well available around here. And Brooklyn used to be pretty well distributed, even in North Carolina. And 
we went to Total Wine. We went to Publix, which is the grocery store around here that generally has the best beer selection. And I, I was looking around. I was like, why? We we looked at uh, Salude, which we used to do meetups at, but it is generally our go-to local beer shop. Why, I was like, why is Brooklyn so poorly distributed? And then I looked online, and it looks like in December of 2019, Brooklyn took a strategy where they laid off a bunch of their in-house sales representatives and went to a strategy where they were working to develop relationships with their distributor representatives to better <laughs> place them into the marketplaces so they didn't have to have so much of a strong in-house sales team. And we cannot find this beer. So Gee, that worked so well, didn't it? I mean, it may maybe it was a liability for them, but hey, I'm just saying those two things coincide. <laughs> The other beer that I found that was a Sriracha Ace only that you might be able to find is Neponia, or depending on where you're listing it, Ancient Neponia, because the li- the name of the beer is Neponia, but it says Ancient on the label right above that. <laughs> uh, and that is from Hidachino Nest Brewing Company. So look in your import section and it's, uh, they'll, they'll have their white, obviously, but if you can find their Neponia, that is all Sriracha Ace hops. Mm. So if you are looking to try something that is maybe well out of your normal hop wheelhouse, this is a place to go. There you go. It's a bummer that we couldn't find some for the the show, but, you know, someday, someday we'll find some more Sriracha Ace. Yeah, I mean, we used to have a bottle, but I'm pretty sure that it (laughs) was poured out after the hops would have been long gone anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, if you would like to follow information on those things, you can obviously go to the show notes at draftmechanic.net or boardgames.beer. Danielle will put hyperlinks in the text markup language for you. (laughs) hyperlinks in the text markup language yeah so time to go to a break and we'll wrap this one up sound good sounds great want a second opinion on some of the games we talked about on this episode check out some other great content creators at punchboardmedia.com all right well we are rolling into the final segment of the show we don't have a final round from last episode because i'm still trying to get my feet under me again but here are the feet here are my feet um I guess no, that's weird. You can't see feet on the on the audio. Just give him the final, final round. I have a final round for next episode. This one came up as I was thinking about Bargain Quest. I want to hear from our listeners. Tell us about a game that had been around for a while and was kind of always in your like sphere, but you never got a chance to play, and it just blew your socks off off of the feet that I was recently talking about. Basically, I'm looking for a game that kind of had a similar experience that we had with Bargain Quest. I want to know about games that you would kind of like, eh, I'll get to it eventually. And then you try and like, oh, crap, why was I waiting on this? I could have been playing this all along. I want to hear about that kind of game. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested, please jump into the Draft Mechanic Slack. It's at draftmechanic.net slash Slack. I will can... also put it in the Board Game Geek Guild notes. Thank you. And you can also go to the Board Game Geek Guild, Guild number 2470, and do the show notes thing there. But... As we don't have anything for last episode, and it is getting very late into this episode, I think it is time for us to wrap up. And I can tell you, you can go to draftmechanic.net for all your draft mechanic related beer and board game needs. You can also find us on the internet at your favorite social medias, as long as those social medias are Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Just go to at Draft Mechanic. It's very simple to find us there. You can also send us an email at draftmechanic at gmail.com. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it is a thing that we have available. Like you just said, we have a Board Game Geek Guild that is guild number 2470, so check out the thread for this episode there. Mm -hmm. And there are no local game nights obviously coming up because we don't do public game nights right now. Someday we'll be back. Hopefully, oh God, I hope, please. In the meantime, I encourage you to go check out Gray Fox Games because we are sponsored by Gray Fox Games. You can visit grayfoxgames.com and sign up for their newsletter for the latest. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. (sighs) All right. I feel like we're really getting back into the swing of this podcasting thing. So much so that we've got everything covered and we can just end the episode now. No. As always, I would like to remind our listeners to please game responsibly and tell them that I'll see them back here in two weeks for another round. It's true. We'll see you then. Someday you'll remember. No, no. After 123 episodes, I'm never, ever, ever going to remember. Night. Night. Draft Mechanic episode 123 is recorded on Sunday, August 23rd, 2020 in front of a live studio cat. Where's the cat anyway? Please in. stricken do not go gently into that good Hey, this is Patrick. And this is Eric from Patrick, Patrick and, and Eric in the, in the morning. morning. 
Join us every now and again for about a half an hour as we freeform chat about whatever's on our minds and how it all relates back to our favorite hobby, board gaming. Patrick and Eric in the Morning can be found on the What Did You Play This Week podcast feed and on the Punchboard Media site. Happy listening. Punchboard Media. Where we all bring something to the table. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com.